morning, everyone. Um, from Manila, uh, and I hope you're all doing well. I am Isabel Nazareno from the Ateneo de Manila University, and I will be the moderator for this morning session. To formally welcome us to this session is the president of Father Saturnino Urios University, Reverend Father John Christian Young. So I turn uh, the floor over to Father Young, who will share a brief message before we begin. Itaas po natin ang ating kanang kamay Good sa lagay ng panunumpa at sabay-sabay nating bigkasin ang panunumpa ng katapatan sa watawat ng Pilipinas. Ako ay Pilipino, buong katapatang nanunumpa sa watawat ng Pilipinas at sa bansang kanyang sinasagisan na may dangal, katarungan at kalayaan na pinakikilos na sambayan ng maka makatao, makakalikasan at makabansa which will focus on the early Philippine and Southeast Asian boat building and gold crafting technology. Boat building and gold crafting is intimately linked with the pre-colonial culture of Butuan, as evidenced by numerous archaeological finds. Sadly, these technologies have not survived in Butuan. The presentations of scholars and experts from all over the world on these topics are in a way part of the recovery of our identity as Butuanans and as Filipinos. At this point, I wish to thank Dr. Nicole Rodriguez and Ms. Kim De Assis for doing the heavy lifting in organizing this 11th session. Again, welcome and good morning. Um, I now would like to call on one of our co-hosts, Kim, to give us an overview for this uh, session for today. Kim? Yes, good morning. Good morning, Ma'am Isa. Good morning, everyone. As Father John mentioned, this session is entitled The Early Philippine and Southeast Asian Boat Building and Gold Crafting Technology uh, this is hosted by Father Saturnino Urias University, which is located in Butuan City, Philippines. This is the 11th session of the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. This session has nine panels and uh, we'll start this morning and we'll end uh, until December 10, 2021. The first two days will be dedicated to studies on gold and we will have our esteemed resource speakers uh, for these panels, uh, starting uh, with uh, Dr. Florina Capistrano Baker of the Ayala Museum, Mr. Victor Estrella of the Philippine Normal University and Ateneo de Manila University. Then uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, we will have Dr. Michael Armand Canilao of the National Museum of the Philippines. Mr. Kenneth Isguera of the Ayala Museum. And in the afternoon, we will have Dr. John Mixik of the National University of Singapore. December 8 and 9 will be on the studies about boats and boat buildings. And we, we will have our, as our resource speakers, uh, in the morning, we will have Dr. Ligaya Laksina, morning of December 8, uh, from the University of the Philippines. And in the afternoon, we will have Dr. Pierre Yves Mangwan of the French School of Asian Studies. Then on the on Thursday, we will have Dr. Bernadette Abrera of the UP Diliman, then Ms. Agni Mokhtar uh, from the Regional Agency for Archaeological Research uh, from Indonesia. Then in the afternoon, we will have Dr. Mary Jane Luis Bologna of the National Museum of the Philippines. The last panel, which is panel I, is or will be in the afternoon of December 10, Friday. And uh, it will be on the local peoples in Fegapeta with Dr. Feliz Noel Rodriguez of the Ateneo de Zamboanga. The boats and the gold artifacts are two of the most important archaeological finds in Butuan that uh, FSU 
is grateful to have the mentioned experts to share with us their studies in Butuan, the Philippines, and Southeast Asia. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you, Kim. So as you've heard, we really have an exciting Itaas po natin ang ating kanang kamay. I now invite all of you or you can join not to this morning. Itaas po natin ang ating kanang kamay sa lagay ng panunumpa at sabay-sabay nating bigkasin ang panunumpa ng katapatan sa watawat ng Pilipinas. Ako ay Pilipino, buong katapatang nanunumpa sa watawat ng Pilipinas at sa bansang kanyang sinasagisag na may dangal, katarungan at kalayaan na pinakikilos ng sambayanang makajos, makatao, makakalikasan at makabansa. She received the AB in Humanities, cum laude, from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. Dr. Capistrano Baker was formerly Museum Director of the Ayala Museum in the Philippines, where she is also currently a consultant. Formerly Research Assistant for Oceania in the Department of the Arts, of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, she curated the exhibition Divine Protection, Batak Art of North Sumatra, and authored the book Art of Islands Southeast Asia, the Fred and Rita Rickman Collection in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Since 2000, her research has focused on Philippine specificities within a meta-narrative of global exchange from the 10th to the 13th centuries and 16th to the 19th centuries, investigating Thanks, historical Mirana. patterns and genealogies of forms, cultural hybridity, and renegotiated forms. identities. Her book, Philippine Ancestral Gold, documents previously unpublished material suggesting early trade with neighbors in the Indian Ocean and South China Sea. In 2014, she curated a permanent installation of the Pacific Gallery at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. In 2014, the she curated the as a primary of government the funds the formulation of the first to effective the exhibition, the 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 exhibition the the Gold Treasures of Forgotten Kingdoms at the Asia Society Museum in New York and wrote the exhibition the Department of Foreign Affairs. As the Prime she Agency of Government responsible for the formulation and implementation of Philippine foreign policy, it commits to efficient DFA quality policy, the Department of Foreign Affairs, as the prime agency of government responsible for the and visual culture of entangled empires, 1565 to 1898. Her scholarly work has been supported by grants from Columbia University, Ford Foundation, Asian Cultural Council, American Association of University Women, Japan Foundation, Loxin Foundation, Metropolitan Museum of Art, and Getty Research Institute. So let's now turn our attention to the presentation that she prepared for us this morning. Good morning. I'd like to thank the Philippine National Quincentennial Committee and the Father Saturnino Urios University for organizing this conference on early boat building and gold crafting technology. The title of my talk is Before 1521, Retrieving the Hindu Buddhist Presence in Ancient Butuan. Early Hindu Buddhist presence in the Philippines has largely been ignored in mainstream scholarship and requires a re-evaluation. Accordingly, this paper aims to re-inscribe the Hindu-Buddhist substratum in the Philippines in general and in northeastern Mindanao in particular. This talk is organized in three parts. First, I provide an overview of early Butuan and goldsmithing traditions. Second, I discuss convergences in material culture of ancient Butuan and East Java in Indonesia. Third, I explore connections with South India and conclude with strategies for future research. I focus on four specific figures that reaffirm Indonesian and South Indian connections, namely from left to right, the Agusan gold image recovered near Agusan River in 1917, 
a gold vessel in the form of a half bird, half female canary, a chariot shaped image, and a female image with flame like halo. These last three images were all recovered in the Butuan area in 1981. Archaeological excavations conducted by the Philippine National Museum in the 1970s confirmed the existence of a circa 10th to 13th century Mindanao polity documented in the Songxi or History of the Song Dynasty as the Kingdom of Putuan or Butuan, which sent trade missions to China and engaged in maritime trade with Champa in present-day Vietnam, as you see on the map. More than 100 discarded clay crucibles used in melting and processing gold and thousands of Song Dynasty trade ceramics recovered in association with the boats suggest local goldsmithing and a thriving trade network. Archaeologist Wilfrido Ronquillo suggests, in fact, that Butuan's vast gold reserves may be a major reason for ancient Butuan's ascendance. Early sources also note the use of gold dust, gold rings, and gold coins, such as piloncitos, as currency, attesting to a flourishing maritime trade network. In 2013, National Museum archaeologists led by Dr. Ois Bolunia excavated boat number four and in addition discovered a much larger balangay, boat number nine, the largest vessel discovered to date estimated to measure about 25 meters or 82 feet when fully excavated on the right. I would like to point out that these impressive dimensions are consistent with Pigafetta's description of the size of Balangay Magellan and his men encountered. In addition, irregular recovery since 1917 of pre-Hispanic gold objects associated with this early polity culminated in the spectacular discovery in 1981 of a gold hoard known as the Surigao treasure, which included the figures shown earlier. The iconography of many objects in this important corpus provides tangible evidence of the presence of Hindu-Buddhist concepts in ancient Butuan before the arrival of Islam circa 14th century and Christianity 500 years ago. Areas of irregular finds on the left show most recoveries in riverine and coastal areas. Compared with the distribution of gold mines in the archipelago on the right, the sites of gold recovery correspond to regions with rich gold deposits. These gold recoveries correspond to areas near gold mines, suggesting that they were likely manufactured from locally available gold. The Songxi and Antonio Pigafetta's account of Ferdinand Magellan's voyage in 1521 provide the earliest written records of ancient Butuan, which both sources describe as a kingdom ruled by a king. The archaeological record supports the written sources, suggests a 10th to 13th century date, and locates ancient Butuan's probable location near the mouth of the Agusan River, where it empties into Butuan Bay. It has been suggested, based on the archaeological evidence, that Butuan mysteriously declined in the 13th century. Although Pigafetta's account of Magellan's encounter with the king of Butuan in 1521 suggests that Butuan continued in some form until Magellan's arrival. Pigafetta describes Magellan's encounter with Raja Kulambu, uh, quote, in the island of that king who came to the ship, were mines of gold, which is found by digging from the earth large pieces as large as walnuts and eggs. And all the vessels he uses are likewise of gold. And he was the most handsome person whom we saw. He had very black hair to his shoulders and two large gold rings hanging from his ears. At his side, he had a dagger with a long handle and all of gold. His island is called Butuan, end quote. I'd like to point out that the Raja is the Sanskrit word for king, referring to Hindu kings. 
16th century illustrations from the Boxer Codex suggest that the use and perhaps even the manufacture of these gold ornaments and ritual objects persisted to the early contact period. The new translation of the Boxer Codex by George Souza and Geoffrey Turley, 2016, rectifies the previously inaccurate identification of the Tagalog people here as Moro when they were in fact Hindu. Additionally, Pigafetta's description of the conversion of Raja Humabon in Cebu makes it clear that they were not Muslim. And I quote, There we set up the cross. If they had been Moors, we should have put up a column as a sign of greater achievement, for these Moors are more difficult to convert than the heathen. Unquote. So the title of Raja does not refer to Islamic rulers as widely assumed today, but to Hindu rulers. With this brief background on ancient Butuan, I now provide a, an overview of Butuan gold and gold working traditions. In 2013, I worked with a fellow scholar in residence at the Getty Research Institute to scientifically examine gold beads formerly in the Loxin collection to identify the elemental composition of discrete areas and gain insight into modes of manufacture. So we used X-ray fluorescence or XRF spectroscopy of a small diamond-shaped bead, for example, which revealed high gold content you see in the chart uh, with traces of silver and copper. It also showed that the bead wasn't cast but hammered into a strip that was folded into a diamond shape. We also tried to determine if solder was used in granulation, for recent research indicates that the usual solder of low melting lead or tin was not used in the early gold of Indonesia, and we wanted to see if the same was true of the Philippine gold. So spot scanning where the granules fused up to the base uh, sheet gold revealed very high gold content, but no solder, a finding consistent with other early Southeast Asian material. Despite time constraints, we were able to generate basic information confirming the great potential of scientific analysis and archaeometallurgy to gain more insight into the early societies that produced these ancient gold objects. So besides elemental analysis, comparative studies of goldsmithing traditions is also useful. The Butuan material presents sophisticated gold working techniques such as casting, which I'll compare later to the Indonesian material. Repousse and chasing techniques involve hammering thin sheets of pure and high carat gold, such as these modesty covers. Granulation required the fusion of tiny globules of gold to the base sheet gold at precise temperatures. Loop and loop chains involved inserting previously prepared gold loops into each other, creating a somewhat squared profile, as you see on the left. A similar technique was used to create these woven belts. were so finely worked they resemble woven textiles. Cut work and open work techniques are also evident, such as this ritual vessel with Chinese Qi Lin and Phoenix imagery, indicating contact with Chinese forms and a long tradition of goldsmithing before contact with Spain in 1521. It is most likely that Butuan was connected in some way to the commercial network of the Srivijayan Empire, which controlled much of present-day Indonesia, the Malay archipelago, from the 7th to 12th centuries. It is believed that Srivijaya traded extensively with India and China. Transcultural interactions along trade routes generated syncretic hybrid forms and concepts. Similarities between the material culture of Mindanao and Java are particularly striking, suggesting close pre-colonial ties. I'd like to point out that despite these close links, the Philippines are not included in this map, which I hope further studies by the next generation of scholars will eventually rectify. Indonesian expressions of Hindu and Buddhist concepts which 
ultimately derived from India, are critical links to understanding Philippine pre-colonial gold. Stylized versions of the Sanskrit symbol Sri, for example, signifying good uh, fortune, such as seen on these cast gold rings on the top, from the Philippines on the left and Indonesia on the right, suggest shared Indian sources. The two rings below in the shape of buffalo horns Philippines on the left, Indonesia on the right, are associated with the Hindu god Shiva. Other gold works from Butuan and Java with Indian iconography include the bird-like Garuda on top uh, and the conch shell or Shanka below, both associated with the Hindu god Vishnu. A modesty plaque from the Indian shipwreck off the Java Sea below right is clearly related to the Butuan example on the left, a tradition that relied on feminine amulets to protect the wearer from evil spirits. Fern-shaped handles from Butuan and Java are another example of localized expressions of related traditions. On the left, an implement handle from Butuan, and on the right, a weapon handle from the Intan shipwreck near Java. Granular gold ornaments recovered in Java and Borneo on the right had initially perplexed scholars and co incorrectly identified as ear ornaments or hair ornaments in the early literature. On the left, similar ornaments from Butuan. Note similar objects in the Boxer Codex used as finials that weigh down the ends of waist cords worn by the Visayan couple on the right, attesting to cultural connections between ancient Visayas and northeastern Mindanao, which is often considered a single cultural area. These flamboyant ear ornaments from Butuan on the left are larger versions of related Javanese ornaments on the right that feature a central penanular with a fruit or bud on each side. Early sources suggest that larger ornaments, such as on the left, were more uh, likely worn by men, while women wore smaller ornaments, usually with floral motifs. Having demonstrated close convergences between gold ornaments from Butuan and Java, I now turn to the first of the four anthropomorphic figures I mentioned at the start of the talk. A remarkable gold vessel in the form of a kinari, in Hindu mythology a half-bird, half-female celestial being, was accidentally discovered in present-day Surigao del Sur province during an irrigation project in 1981, part of the so-called Surigao treasure. The cast human head is exquisitely modeled. Her hair is elegantly pulled back in a bun and adorned with a floral ornament. The body is worked in repose and chased with delicate feather patterns that you see here. On the right, you can also see where the wings and tail have been snipped off, most likely melted for gold by pot hunters. Although the gold vessel's function is unclear, a kinari-shaped bronze vessel uh, from Java, it's a bronze lamp in the Metropolitan's collection, is of similar size and dates to approximately the same period. It's unclear if the gold kinari from Butuan was also used as a lamp, but it's almost certainly a ritual container for some sort of liquid. The small size is reminiscent of oil lamps held in one's hand when performing arti, or the Hindu ceremony of waving flames from lighted wicks before sacred images. Its presence in northeastern Mindanao is a gold seated figure popularly called the Agusan image. Formerly in storage, but now on permanent exhibition at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. A local resident found this female image near the Agusan River when heavy rains washed it ashore in 1917. The solid cast figure is about 5 inches high and weighs more than 4 pounds. She is seated with legs folded in the Vajrasana or diamond position, with two feet resting on the thighs. Her arms are akimbo with fingers curled inward, with the back of her hands resting on the hips you see on the left. She also wears a torso ornament or body that crisscrosses it in the back. Local residents fondly but mistakenly call her the Golden Tara of Agusan after the scholar Juan Francisco argued in 1963 that the figure portrays an Indo-Javanese queen or a Tara. 
The misidentification in this dilemma just demonstrates how Indonesian artworks can illuminate Philippine phenomena. Scholars have debated the statue's identity since she first came to light. The Dutch scholar F.D.K. Bosch suggested as early as the 1920s that the Agusan image was similar to the Nganyuk figures on the right recovered in East Java in 1913. Note that while the figures are indeed similar, the stylistic rendering of the Agusan image is distinct. A colleague, the Buddhist scholar Rob Linruff in Personal Communications, identifies the Agusan image as Vajralasya, or the gesture of love, who is always shown with her hands on her hips and sits at the southeast corner of the inner circle in a three-dimensional Vajradhatu mandala. In 2007, the Field Museum tested the image using XRF spectroscopy, which revealed gold content of at least 18 carats or higher, alloyed with copper and silver. Former Field Museum curator Ben Bronson suggests that the presence of silver supports the museum's circa 11th to 14th century date for gold-copper-silver alloys frequently occur in early Southeast Asian gold, as we saw also in the gold beads tested at the Getty. This reposé plaque on the left is also part of the Surigao treasure and portrays a female image with upraised hands in the orant or prayer position. It is generally believed that Hindu and Buddhist influences filtered into the Philippines via Indonesia. Sure, yes. Was accidentally discovered in present day Surigao del Sur province during an irrigation project in 1981, part of the so called Surigao treasure. Can we please um, um, make the sound lou louder, uh, Nina? It's exquisitely modeled. Her hair is elegantly pulled back in a bun and adorned with a floral ornament. The body is worked in repose and chased with delicate feather patterns that you see here. On the right, you can also see where the wings and tail have been snipped off, most likely melted for gold by pot hunters. Although the gold vessel's function is unclear, a kinari shaped bronze vessel uh, from Java, it's a bronze lamp in the Metropolitan's collection, is of similar size and dates to approximately the same period. It's unclear if the gold kinari from Butuan was also used as a lamp, but it's almost certainly a ritual container for some sort of liquid. The small size is reminiscent of oil lamps held in one's hand when performing arti, or the Hindu ceremony of waving flames from lighted wicks before sacred images. Another marker of Buddhist presence in Northeastern Mindanao is a gold seated figure popularly called the Agusan image, formerly in storage, but now on permanent exhibition at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. A local resident found this female image near the Agusan River when heavy rains washed it ashore in 1917. The solid cast figure is about five inches high and weighs more than four pounds. She's seated with legs folded in the Vajrasana or diamond position with two feet resting on the thighs. Her arms are akimbo with fingers curled inward with the back of her hands resting on the hips you see on the left. 
She also wears a torso ornament or body that crisscrosses in the back. Local residents fondly but mistakenly call her the golden Tara of Agusan. After the scholar Juan Francisco argued in 1963 that the figure portrays an Indo-Javanese queen or a Tara. The misidentification in this dilemma just demonstrates how Indonesian artworks can illuminate Philippine phenomena. Scholars have debated the statue's identity since she first came to light. The Dutch scholar F.D.K. Bosch suggested as early as the 1920s that the Agusan image was similar to the Nanyuk figures on the right recovered in East Java in 1913. Note that while the figures are indeed similar, the stylistic rendering of the Agusan image is distinct. A colleague, the Buddhist scholar Rob Linroth in Personal Communications, identifies the Agusan image as Vajralasya, or the gesture of love, who is always shown with her hands on her hips and sits at the southeast corner of the inner circle in a three-dimensional Vajralhatu mandala. In 2007, the Field Museum tested the image using XRF spectroscopy, which revealed gold content of at least 18 carats or higher, alloyed with copper and silver. Former Field Museum curator Ben Bronson suggests that the presence of silver supports the museum's circa 11th to 14th century date for gold copper silver alloys frequently occur in early Southeast Asian gold, as we saw also in the gold beads tested at the Getty. This repose plaque on the left is also part of the Surigao treasure and portrays a female image with upraised hands in the orange or prayer position. It is generally believed that Hindu and Buddhist influences filtered into the Philippines via Indonesia. So Javanese representations of Hindu deities and gold plaques, such as one of Vishnu on the right, reinforces the likelihood that this gold female image on the left is also a devotional object. The sketch on the right by Cecilia Loxian shows how the image holds small objects, including a banner, possibly one of her identifying attributes. She wears an elaborate headdress of hooked and curled appendages and multiple layers of necklaces, similar to actual adornments recovered from the same period. I've previously argued that this may portray a localized version of the Hindu goddess Kali, whose distinctive attributes include the flame-like hairstyle. The recovery of an almost identical repose plaque on the right suggests a standard iconography that represents an important female deity, a religious icon or likha, a Philippine term for divine images that derives from the Sanskrit lekha, meaning god or deity. It is useful at this point to note briefly the decline of Sri Vijaya power after the Chola dynasty of southern India attacked Sri Vijaya in 1025, common era, gaining dominance in the waters around Southeast Asia. Despite Sri Vijaya's decline, the trade routes continued to be widely used. Again, the Philippines are excluded from this map, erasing the close engagements among pre-colonial Philippine coastal communities and neighboring Indian and Indonesian polities. Hindu imagery from the Chola dynasty circulated in localized forms in Southeast Asia, such as this iconic image of Shiva Nataraja or the dancing Shiva on the right, translated in stone relief in Champa, present-day Vietnam, on the left. I now circle back to my suggested connection between the Butuan female icon and the Hindu concept of Kali. According to the Hindu narrative, only a female divinity can destroy the demon Mahesha. So the male gods created the warrior goddess Durga, who in turn created her avatar Kali, and the two goddesses vanquished the demon and his progeny. 
Representations of Kali in South India portray the goddess with flame-like aura and multiple upraised hands, holding various attributes. On the right, the 12th century image of Kali from South India in the collection of the Museo Gimé echoes the conventionalized halo distinguishing Tamil representations of Kali echoed by the hooked and curled appendages of the gold female from Butuan on the left. Indian traders are said to have been active in Southeast Asia in search of gold and tin from at least the 6th century before the Common Era. According to Indian scholars Ajit Singh Rai and Pareshwar Roy, sometime after the heavy Hinduization of Java between the 1st to 7th centuries, Hindu and Buddhist influences spread further to Borneo, Mindanao, and the Visayas, penetrating even the northernmost island of Luzon. Philippine links to Hindu cultures, most likely through Indonesia and South Indian traders, is supported by linguistic place names, family names, and names of deities derived from Indian sources. For example, Philippine place names across the archipelago include Sanskrit words such as Kalinga, Naga, Linga, and Diwata, the latter a place named near Butuan that is mentioned in the Laguna Copper Plate inscription. Elite titles include Sri Bhattas Chaja, the 11th century king of Butuan, Surya Diraja, Laksamana, Bendahara, and Hari for king. Philippine female divinities are called Diwata from the Sanskrit Devata or deity, and the pre-Christian word for the supreme god is Bathala, from the Sanskrit Batara and the Indonesian Batara Guru, meaning Shiva. The Tagalog word for Likha, for divine images of gold, wood, or stone, also derives from the Sanskrit Lekha, meaning god or deity. In the absence of written records on religious practices in ancient Butuan, we must turn to accounts of religious beliefs in neighboring Visayan cultures for clues. For example, William Henry Scott notes that, quote, in every town they have their god called Diwata, all called Diwata in general, but as a personal name in their, uh, depending on their own town. Miguel uh, de Luarca's list of Diwatas in Panay in 1582 includes Lalahon, a fire-breathing goddess of Mount Kanlaon who could be invoked for good harvest but who also wreaked destruction if angered. Other Diwatas in Agib and Malanduk were invoked for success in battle. The Butuan female plot is likely one of such diwatas, probably with a specific name now lost to us, her form and concepts perhaps similar to the Hindu concept of the protective destructive Kali, if not a localization of Kali herself. In 1981, two intriguing represent plaques appeared in the antiques market. One that you see here acquired by a private collector and the other by Leandro and Cecilia Loxin now at Ayala Museum. This plaque was misidentified as a pectoral or chest ornament and published upside down in 1983. It was the archaeologist collector Cecilia Loxin who correctly identified the plaque in this proper orientation as a chariot on the left with a large human face at the apex and a smaller full figure at the bottom with two wheels below. The sketch on the right shows the details better. You see uh, the face in the top, the full figure in the bottom and the two wheels supporting the figure. Here's a closer view of the wheels, which call to mind the Hindu concept of dharma or the wheel of the law, as well as sundials that tell time based on the movement of the sun. Again, you see the detail of the anthropomorphic uh, face on the top. The full figure possibly portraying the charioteer. 
One interpretation I've suggested is a reference to the sun god Surya, who's often portrayed riding on a chariot along with his charioteer. Reverence for the sun occurs in many cultures, including pre-colonial Philippines. William Henry Scott notes, for example, that natural forces were personified for reverence or worship. Chief among them were the sun and the moon. The relatively small size of the chariot plaques suggests they were ritual objects of devotion, similar to small-scale replicas of temples and stupas that occur in many Hindu-Buddhist cultures. I suggest a possible connection to a specific architectural landmark used by 13th century Tamil traders navigating the east coast of India. The Sun Temple in Konark in coastal Orissa or present-day Odisha, the ancient Kalinga state in India dedicated to the Hindu god Surya, built in the shape of a chariot with immense wheels that served as sundials. The Konar Temple is part of the ancient Surya cult that flourished across India and was dedicated to the worship of the sun god. According to ancient scripture on Surya, known as Surya Panishad, quote, from the sun arises all beings. The sun sustains them all. They all vanish into the sun, unquote. Thus celebrating the sun as creator, protector, and destroyer. The enormous temple was built around 1250 in the Common Era on the seashore and used as a navigational landmark by ancient sailors. Relief sculptures portraying foreign personages such as Persian merchants and Chinese traders attest to the global nature of early Indian kingdoms. It's not difficult to imagine small-scale images of this iconic landmark circulating within the Indian Ocean trade network. Ethnographic research is another useful strategy to illuminate archaeological material. For example, an ancient chariot festival still celebrated annually in Odisha is Purirat Yatra, which features towering temple-shaped chariots of carved and painted wood, lavishly decorated with embroidered cloths. What's fascinating is the detailed process by which the carpenters, blacksmiths, Tailors and painters, around 200 of them, who work without written instructions, which are verbally handed down through the generations. Each chariot carries a carved wooden image of a deity, foremost among them the Lord Jagannath, a manifestation of Krishna. According to Indian holy text, the chariot symbolizes the human body, and the deity inside the chariot is the soul. Wisdom is the charioteer that controls the mind and its thoughts. Suggested connections to South Indian and Indonesian forms, while necessarily speculative and requiring further field and archival research, nonetheless offer useful springboards for illuminating enigmatic fragments of Hindu-Buddhist forms. I thank the Asian Cultural Council for our research travel grant to explore these connections and hope to be able to do so when the global pandemic situation allows. In summary, we know from archeological material recovered with the Butuan boats that included hundreds of clay crucibles, worked and unworked gold and Chinese export ware that an ancient coastal polity that engaged in gold crafting and that had contact with the Song Dynasty in China flourished near present-day Butuan Bay. Archaeologists have suggested that ancient Butuan flourished from the 10th to 13th centuries, then mysteriously declined. Pigafetta's account of Magellan's encounter with Raja Kulambu whom he describes as the king of Butuan, indicates that Butuan continued in some form until Magellan's arrival in 1521. And the king's title of Raja indicates Hindu connections. The lack of information on Butuan in the 16th century Boxer Codex is perplexing, although there are detailed accounts of Tagalogs and Visayans who are described as having customs similar to each other, with Tagalog groups being more affluent. According to Sousa and Turley's new translation, the Tagalog are described as Hindu. 
The honorific title of Tagalog and Visayan kings was Raja, again, indicating Hindu connections. In Putuan, material evidence provided by the gold objects discussed above strongly suggests cultural connections with Java and South India, likely through flourishing trade networks controlled by Sri Vijaya in Southeast Asia and Chola in the Indian Ocean. These findings need further substantiation and refinement through further research. In conclusion, there's a critical need to reassess the history of Putuan and its connections to early Southeast Asian and South Indian cultures. In the absence of written documents, the gold objects, in particular the four figures discussed, namely the Agusan Vajralasya, Kinari vessel, the chariot and female plaques must be studied in light of related forms in circa 10th century to 13th century Java and South India, with particular attention to the ancient states of Kalinga on the east coast and Tamil Nadu in the southernmost tip. These golden treasures are tangible evidence of a dimly remembered past that must be recovered. Distinctive iconography strongly suggests the presence of Hindu Buddhist ideas, most likely through dynamic movements of peoples and goods within the early Southeast Asian and Indian Ocean trade networks. Transdisciplinary strategies are needed to illuminate intersections and localizations of forms and concepts for a more accurate remapping of cultural genealogies and Hindu Buddhist spheres of influence as we reinscribe and reinsert fragments that allow us to reconfigure the larger cultural cartography. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baker, for such an interesting uh, presentation. And we already have several questions lined up, but I encourage our viewers to also type in any questions they might have in the chat box or in the Q&A. Um, for those who are participating via FB Live, you may write your questions on the comment section and the technical team will track uh, these and send it to us. So you can ask one direct question, uh, hopefully a concise one, and if needed, one follow-up question. But perhaps to give you time to do that, just to recap some of the uh, main points brought up by uh, Dr. Baker. Um, one would be how these gold objects, the few examples that she highlighted today, um, serve as tangible evidence of cultural, in particular Hindu, Buddhist influences and ties and commercial links with Indonesia and South India, which has not really been fully explored nor reflected in cartographic representations showing trade routes and linkages. Okay? And um, that these images shown um, are also, uh, they show evidence of localization. Okay. Um, they are locally crafted from gold, uh, local gold sources, okay? And the importance of transdisciplinary approaches to uh, getting to know this portion of our pre-Islamic, pre-colonial history. So aside from uh, history and archaeology, scientific methods, um, new technologies that are emerging have been very helpful in illuminating information not previously known regarding these objects okay and it it's very important to look back on these even as you know at present we highlight and celebrate uh, uh, this 500 years from the arrival of uh, the Spanish and the introduction of Christianity, we should remember that there are earlier traditions that were present in the archipelago already. So um, with that, 
let's dive into the questions we have. Um, all right. So, Nina, uh, it's very interesting. So this is from one of our viewers who says it's very interesting to see the Indonesian influence in Butuan, especially compared to Igorot Gold. Um, so she asks, what area was the gold from? And was there any data on how the gold ore was processed? <clears throat> um, thank you for the question. Um, first of all, if I um, understand the question correctly, uh, the, the question is regarding the connection between the Butuan gold and the Indonesian material. Um, I'm not sure where the Igorot uh, comes in because that's a totally different um uh, tradition uh, but i'll answer yeah mentioning that there's also a gold tradition in the north oh yes of course an interesting um contrast and comparison yeah i see i see yes so definitely about the source of the ore and the processing definitely yeah. um well, uh, in uh, first of all, I'll address the connections with uh, with Indonesia. What 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 we see in the Butuan <clears throat> material, which is relatively dated based on the uh, associated ceramics found with the with the gold, uh, is a tentative relative dating of between the 10th to the 13th centuries, although they could very well be later as well. This is relative dating. Um, but what's really interesting is when you look at the same chronological horizon in Java, uh, the closest, for example, the Agusan image, which we have identified as Bajralasya, is very clearly related to the East Javanese Nanjuk figures also from the 10th to the 12th centuries. Uh, clearly um, a similar um, sculpture as part of a three-dimensional Vajradhatu or Diamond World Mandala. So the Indonesian material was uh, recovered in Nanjuk in East Java in 1913. And the Agusan image was discovered in 1917. And it was a, a very, um, I guess, debated, uh, there was a, a debate among scholars as to the, the identity of the image. But um, during this time in the 1920s, when um, the, the Dutch scholar FDK Bosch already cited the uh, connection to the Nanyuk images, it was not like today where everything's instant, where you instantly get images and, and you know everything's on Facebook or social media and you immediately see the photographs. So it took a while for, for scholars in Asia um, and scholars working on the Butuan material to actually see what these Nanjuk images look like. And so now that we see there are some of these images at the, in the collection of the Asian Society in New York City, and there are some at the Metropolitan Museum, uh, which is what I showed you, they're clearly related. So, um, so, so and of course, now that uh, the images of Agusan image are more accessible to scholars overseas who are uh, Hindu and Buddhist specialists, now uh, we know that it's actually Vajralasya, uh, mm -hmm. part of a three-dimensional mandala. Uh, and she sits in the southeast corner. She's the gesture of love. So it's clearly a, a Buddhist. This is not Hindu now, right? So you have Hinduism, you have Buddhism, and you kind of have a merging of the two. But the Agusan uh, image, Vajralasya, is Buddhist. It's part of a Buddhist Vajradhatu Mandala. And it's obviously derived from um, Javanese traditions. So there are many layers to these connections with India, connections with Indonesia uh, that are really fascinating that require more work. So the other part of the question was, uh, do we know about the gold working techniques. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of uh, written material describing the gold of Butuan. We have more uh, written accounts of gold working traditions in the Tagalog region and among the Visayas. We see this in the early 
um, dictionaries of the Tagalog language. We see this in, um, there's a whole um, group of words, goldsmithing words in um, the early, the 16th century, 17th century dictionaries in uh, uh, Visayan language and Tagalog language, but nothing from Butuan. So um, we can only infer from related traditions. We can only guess that it's probably similar. We see from the archaeological data, uh, the archaeological material excavated with the Butuan go, uh, boats, that there were these crucibles, there were these clay crucibles. Uh, so that was probably part of the way that they uh, that they uh, worked the gold and melted it and, and um, uh, removed the impurities from it. But um, the only way we can really uh, try to figure out how it was really work is uh, in reverse order by trying to analyze it, by trying to analyze the existing gold that we have today and using um, archaeometallurgical uh, strategies, uh, XRF spectroscopy. Um, I think there's a speaker this afternoon who's going to talk about uh, more about trying to recover uh, the way, the technological ways in which the gold was created. But uh, regarding, uh, you know, a, a, a clear description of how these things were actually made, uh, that is not something that we have. Okay, thanks. So hopefully there might be ways of digging up new information in the future and we get to know more about um, the the craftsmanship and technologies used. Um, but maybe to push it uh, a bit more, um, is there any evidence of direct contact between um, Butuan and South India? Or does it seem to be mainly indirect through Indonesia and Southeast Asia? As of now, that's a very good question. As of now, we're not really, we don't really have um, enough evidence, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist because this has not been explored before. What we do know is there was direct contact with China because we have the history of the Song Dynasty. We have the annals, the Song Shi, that describe um, trade missions from Butuan to China. Uh, so we know that. We know that Butuan had relations with Champa also because they were rivals. Uh, as of now, um, there are accounts and there are uh, uh, specialists of uh, Indian Ocean trade. And that's kind of what I'm following now is the scholarship on the Indian Ocean trade. You have a lot of archaeological uh, work being done to uh, to clarify the details and and uh, go through the uh, the chronological horizons and the spatial distribution and routes of exchange uh, as the south mostly the South Indian traders uh, on the east coast that's what we're concerned with not so much the west coast because there it was the traders from the east coast and the southernmost tip of India Tamil Nadu uh, who were active in Southeast Asia and you do have scholars working on these various um, uh, trade routes from prehistory to uh, to the period that we're concerned with, which is more uh, towards the 10th to 13th centuries and up to the 16th centuries. Um, so I think there will be a lot of uh, material waiting to be discovered. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that. And I hope that we can... Um, collaborate and cooperate with our colleagues who are expert on the other side of the trade, which is the Indian Ocean. And hopefully we can connect with them and try to connect the dots and see how, um, because there's uh, right now there's actually more information on the Indian trade in Southeast Asia, in Borneo, in Indonesia, but that research doesn't at this point go all the way to the Philippines. And that's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to connect uh, the Philippines and Butuan and try to see how um, that trade uh, connects from Borneo, from Indonesia to Butuan. 
things. So maybe it's a good time to, uh, you know, if you want to know a bit more about that, uh, Dr. Nina Baker has a new book out and it's available at the Ayala Museum um, shop store, uh, Trans-Pacific Engagements. It just very fresh, very recently uh, came out. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, two related questions on um, the craftsmen, uh, presumably in, in Butuan. Um, so one question is, what role does the gold craftsman have in pre-colonial Butuan society? And uh, related to that, you mentioned uh, the localization of images. Um, is there any data identifying if the craftsmen were indeed uh, local or indigenous artisans or were they transplants, foreign traders creating these objects using local materials? It's always a very interesting question, the authorship of these works. I mean, these are questions that um, are posed uh, regarding objects from the pre-colonial period and even during the colonial period. We have questions regarding, you know, the colonial ivories and were they done locally, were they done in China? So similarly, in the pre-colonial period, we have similar questions where, oh, wait, this is too sophisticated. And and I think a lot of uh, overseas scholars and maybe some local scholars as well would sort of be, um, um, would automatically assume and claim that if it's sophisticated, it must have come from another culture. And if it looks primitive, maybe it's local, which isn't really uh, very accurate uh, because of the, um, the, the evidence that we have from the Butuan excavations that there were crucibles here uh, in Butuan. Uh, there were hundreds of crucibles. There was worked and unworked gold, meaning that it was being locally manufactured. Um, there are several words, goldsmithing words, uh, in the vocabularies that indicate knowledge of specific uh, techniques, of sophisticated techniques. Um, there are also differences in, uh, for example, there are widely, there are objects, there are object types that are widely distributed. Some of them are distributed all across the archipelago. So you begin to wonder, oh, okay, were these all done in one workshop or were there several workshops in various areas? And you see differences in the way that they're uh, rendered as well. Uh, some of these objects like the penannulars, the cord weights, you find them not just in the Philippines, not just in Butuan, you find them in the Visayas, Mindoro, you find them in um, Borneo, in Java. They're the same form, but the workmanship's different. And it was really interesting when we uh, exhibited some of those cord weights at the Asia Society Museum, and we had the ones from Butuan, and then we had similar ones from Java, at, from the Metropolitan Museum collection. And most people, again, um, I think we have this kind of a national inferiority complex where if it's wonderful, it must be from overseas. And if it's fabulous, it must, if it's crude, it must be local. But there we exhibited the Butuan um, cord weights beside the Javanese cord weights and the Butuan cord weights were of higher gold content and finer workmanship. So that argument doesn't really hold that if it's primitive, it's local and if it's too sophisticated it looks like it's uh greek or roman or indonesian and it cannot it can't have been locally manufactured um that it's not the case at all um we've also seen the kinari image uh uh the gold kinari vessel which we exhibited side by side with a bronze javanese vessel and again you see the extremely fine workmanship of the Kinari image. Um, so I would say, um, just as a shorter answer to your question, were they local or foreign? I think um, it would be safe to say that the uh, objects of wide distribution, um, some of them, for example, the Sri rings that are cast and you see them everywhere uh, in the Philippines and in the rest of Southeast Asia, some of them may ha well have been 
um, imported. We don't know that. We don't know if they were being imported to us or if we were exporting them. Because when, um, you know, the work of uh, Peter Bellwood for an earlier period with those Ling Ling Ong, um of Nephrite, uh, he's found workshops. Ian, he and his team have found workshops in the Philippines, uh, in the northern part of the Philippines. Uh, so they were made of uh, nephrite imported from Feng Shan, uh, from Taiwan. Material was brought over. And then they were done in the Philippines. The workshops were founded. And then they were exported again. So you have that precedent of uh, you know, imported materials being brought here, manufactured here, and then being exported to the rest of Southeast Asia. Regarding the gold, it's more likely that the gold is from here because as we've seen in the archaeological record, the, uh, the, the gold recoveries are mostly from areas that are um, near the gold mines. And we had uh, such uh, rich gold mines that uh, even um, uh, other um, cultures, for example, India tried to come to Southeast Asia, tried to come to Indonesia, and the Philippines says what they were looking for was gold. So there was no need actually to import gold because we had a, a huge supply of a local material. So I would say it would be a combination of both, uh, possibly some imported material, some imported works especially those that are widely distributed and um but i would argue that it's mostly locally made especially the anthropomorphic figures that are similar to the javanese or the indian figures but stylistically are distinct and so i would argue that these stylistically distinct anthropomorphic figures such as the agusan bashralasya the kinari and the the um the flame-like halo and the chariot appear to be locally made and they are local manifestations and interpretations of um, foreign Hindu and Buddhist forms. Thank you. You know, just listening to all of this, for me, it's really so exciting and it seems that it the, is. More, the more that we know about these objects, the more questions also emerge. Um, um, since you mentioned and 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 what you what you brought up uh, when objects, gold objects were exhibited side by side in uh, the Asia Society mm -hmm. Museum, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I would imagine it's like pre-colonial benchmarking in terms yeah. of like what kinds of gold objects these different cultures produced. And it's great to know that we really did produce these materials of very fine quality. Um, since you mentioned- I'd like to add something to that, the, the side by side. Um, if you remember the images that I showed, the huge flamboyant earrings. Yes. Beside the small Javanese, yes. those were also exhibited side by side. At the um, at the exhibition, and what were the um, reactions of the people? Uh, well, the director, the former director of the uh, Metropolitan Museum, from whom we borrowed the small Javanese, was so impressed with the huge flamboyant Philippine versions. I mean, we're so exaggerated, right? <laughs> we're so, we tend to be so flamboyant. Um, so he actually said, "Well, you know, can we exchange?" Like, uh, I'll take your Philippine and you can have my Javanese. But it was all in jest, of course. But um, yeah, it's quite impressive um, when you put them side by side. And we always assume that, oh, you know, they're they're always better. They're, they're more uh, sophisticated. They have a higher culture. They have all these uh, stone monuments, um, which we don't. Um, so they must have, a, a, you know, a, a more advanced culture, which is not always the case. Great. Um, so again, two related questions um, since you mentioned the imagery. So one viewer asks, can Dr. Baker explore a bit more uh, or talk a bit more about the headdress of the female anthropomorphic images um, and uh, possible symbolisms of these? And then a related question um, in terms of the use of gold ornaments and images, images, if they were indeed once used as amulets, and 
is there any connection to the present day gold colored anting antings created from brass? <clears throat> okay. Thank you for the question. So you have two parts. Uh, one is to discuss the, the flame-like headdress and one is to discuss the amulets and whether it continues, it connects to the present day. So the headdress, it's really, really fascinating. Um, and I'm very grateful to, you know, the, the original collector, Cecilia Loxin, she's been very helpful because she's an anthropologist, ar archaeologist herself, and she's made um, obsessively sketched all these images that are, you know, it's, it would be difficult. It's, it's difficult to really um, recognize the configurations of all these um, repose, um sheets and so with the help of her sketch and also studying it closely at hand the headdress uh looks like the, con the the contours of the headdress are reminiscent of flames uh it's sort of uh reminiscent of a, a halo of flames and that's why why i look for uh, a connection with kali because um there are two hindu deities whose attributes include the flame-like headdress and one is Kali and the other one is Agni, the deity of uh, fire. But Agni is a double-headed uh, deity and it's usually male. Um, so I kind of zeroed in on Kali, but as I said in the presentation, we don't know if it's really Kali. It could be a, a deity, uh, a Diwata, that has a similar concept, related concept, It you know, whose name we don't uh, have forgotten already. But um, what's um, what seems to tie it to Kali is this flame-like headdress and this elaborate um, there's a tree of life. Um, if you um, were able to look closely at the sketch, it's the, the um, outside are flames, but inside is also an elaborate decoration uh, with a tree of life, which is again a very uh, uh, popular motif in Indonesia and in many Southeast Asian cultures because it represents, um, you know, life and the axis mundi that, that connects the uh, our world and the underworld and the upper world. Um, so the tree of life is often considered um, uh, sacred um, and many of the uh, early cultures, uh, early Southeast Asian and Philippine cultures rever revere uh, trees. Um, there are also other uh, floral, floral ornaments and normally you have the orange figure you have the prayer position that that references uh, uh, supernatural ador uh, adornment, uh, adoration, and and power. Now, using the uh, uh, these things as this is not an amulet, right? The the binibini, the kali, uh, the female icon is not used as an amulet. It's a ritual sculpture. Uh, what I referred to as an amulet was the chastity cover, um, the modesty plaque. Um, the modesty plaque, uh, first of all, let's go to the material, gold. In many cultures, not just in the Philippines, um, gold has a very powerful symbolism because it's an eternal metal. It, um, it is forever. Whatever gold we have in the world today is the gold that we've had. Uh, it's melted, reworked, etc. So gold itself, the, the material itself is associated with immortality, with protection, with, uh, with the sun. Um, so it, it's believed to have magical powers just by the nature of the material itself. It, of course, it also has um, um, prestigious um, connotations because of its rarity, it's expensive, so only the elite can can afford this. Um, the amulet that I referred to, and I'm sure the other uh, jewel reforms are also considered amulets. If you study the 16th century um, um, accounts more closely, Alcina, for example, will talk about the kamagi and how the kamagi was uh, associated with feminine um, uh, feminine illnesses. They were worn for protection. It wasn't just for prestige and de to demonstrate wealth, but it was also to protect them. And uh, floral images were 
often associated with females and with female illnesses and with medicinal powers. And this chastity cover uh, in particular was considered an amulet to protect the wearer, usually the female, uh, to protect her reproductive uh, powers uh, because this was a very important part of her, um, her role. Um, so yes, the notion of jewelry as an amulet is something that's not unique to the Philippines. It's something that goes back, that's, I guess, uh, universal. Uh, there was an exhibition, a uh, very interesting exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum about jewelry and also about how jewelry is really like an armor, especially gold jewelry is considered an armor. Um, you have tambourines uh, derived from the rosary, which also are not just jewelry, they're, they're amulets to protect you. And then you have this anting anting, which is uh, usually not of gold, right? Because it's a more popular um, tradition. And so you have more metal alloys made to look like gold that carry on that tradition uh, of uh, jewelry being um, serving a protective function, not just for decoration, but for protection and to serve apotropaic functions. So yes, there's a continuity in that. Great. Okay, so we have several questions, some on uh, uh, technology and um, some on uh, Hindu Buddhist uh, presence in other parts uh, of, of the archipelago. Which one would you like to start with? Um, technology and tools or the Hindu Buddhist presences? <clears throat> oh, maybe the Hindu Buddhist presences? Okay, so um, the question was uh, how widespread is the gold death masks in early Philippines? Ah. Um, and then, and does it identify as Hindu as well? And then a related question from another viewer is, are there remnants of Hindu Buddhist beliefs in other parts of the archipelago aside from Butuan? <clears throat> Good question. Very interesting question. Yes, the gold masks are widely distributed. Uh, which is, again, interesting. Uh, although the full face masks are limited to Butuan. Now you have the orifice covers, you have the nose covers and mouth covers that are spread um, mostly in the Visayas. You have some in uh, Mindoro, um, not so much uh, in the north, um, not so much among the Tagalogs. Although it's you can't really jump to conclusions there because that region that got Tagalogs were Christianized more um, intensively than uh, the southern part, uh, so that might contribute to the the absence of uh, the the masks there because the religious beliefs uh, had uh, changed. Um, but the interesting thing is these gold masks are not limited to the Philippines. Uh, you have gold masks in China, you have gold masks in discovered in um, Southeast Asia, in, in uh, the Taraja region, in Java, you have them in Vietnam and in Cambodia. So it's a tradition that's widespread and you have them of course in the Western world. So again, you have this concept of gold being a protective um, material, and you have this concept of your body openings, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, uh, other parts of the body where the evil spirits might enter your the, the body of the deceased and take over. And that is why you have these uh, coverings. Uh, they're not always of gold in some other cultures. They could be coins, they could be other types of materials, but the, uh, the, the, the notion, um, the idea is to cover the, off the, the, the openings of your body to protect uh, your, the corpse from evil influences that might invade the body. Um, so I hope that answered the question. And um, I forget, what was the, 
What was the follow-up to that? Um, the, uh, uh, evidence of uh, Hindu Buddhist beliefs in other parts of the archipelago. Yes, 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 yes. yes. That, that's fascinating. It's all over. It's it's throughout the archipelago. Um, if you well, this was this talk was focused on Butuan, so I didn't show the other uh, material. But we have uh, just at the Ayala Museum alone, um, the we have one thousand fifty nine objects in the Ayala Museum, and I worked with uh, the late Cecilia Loxin to um, uh, have a distribution map, so just so we'd see where these things were from, and we have uh, the Sri rings which indicate, you know, knowledge of Sanskrit and, um, you know, Hindu Buddhist ideas. Uh, those three rings are distributed all across the archipelago. We have images that are associated with Hindu Buddhist concepts, even in Laguna. So Tagalog region, right? Um, and of course, uh, when we look at the Boxer Codex and we look at the uh, the latest translations that are very accurate, we see that Tagalogs are described as Hindu. And we see this in the archeological record uh, that they they do have these, um, these rings and these um, uh, objects that, that allude to Vishnu and Shiva, um, not in as large a corpus as what you see in the Visayas and in Butuan especially, um, but you see them uh, also in the in the uh, in Luzon. Um, we also have references to um, uh, goldsmiths from Camarines who are especially skilled, according to the. Uh, to the Spanish accounts that these uh, these uh, uh, workers, these goldsmiths from Camarines are especially known to be skilled and they actually were itinerant. They traveled um, on boats um, from, you know, from island to island creating their works. So we do know that it was not just the gold objects that traveled, but the workers, the goldsmiths also traveled within the archipelago. Um, so that accounts also for the similarities in some of the forms and the wide distribution of some of these forms that we see. It's so interesting, the idea that the craftsmen were also traveling because, yes, you know, yes. our, our culture is we need something made, we go to them instead right. of these itinerant goldsmiths. Uh, mm -hmm. going around. So, yeah, it's a ton interesting thing to imagine uh, the movement of not just goods but the people people um, yeah so since you mentioned sanskrit uh earlier um we have some questions regarding the language so you met uh, about the mentioned indian words found in philippine languages are these also found in indonesian languages and then someone also asks is the name of kalinga province uh, from an Indian word? Would you have any yes. comments yes, on yes, that? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Um, yes, the Sanskrit words. Um, in fact, we don't know if um, some scholars, you'd have these different schools of thought. Some scholars would, will claim that the uh, Sanskrit words that we have are uh, arrived to us uh, via Indonesia. Um, mm -hmm. I... I myself mm. uh, would not discount direct direct um, contact with the Tamil traders because they did come to Southeast Asia. Not everything has to come through Indonesia. But yes, you have Sanskrit words uh, in Indonesia. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, we were so used to saying Bathala, Bathalang Mekapal, and we think that this is you know, indigenous to us and we we use it to refer to the Christian God, to our Christian God, but it's actually from, from India. It's from Batara. And Batara uh, in Indonesia was translocalized to Batara Guru. And re actually it refers to, in Indonesia, it refers to the Hindu God Shiva. And so by the time it got to us, it's, you know, Batalang Mekapal, and we use it to refer to the Christian God. But originally it was you know, the Indian um, uh, supreme god, and then it was uh, 
passed on to Indonesia. Of course, there are different dialects in Indonesia, so you can't always say, you know, there's always um, there are always um, variations. But Indonesia also has a place called Linga. They also have a place called Naga, um, as do we. And of course, Linga is part of the Hindu. Uh, you know, uh, uh, vocabulary, uh, sacred vocabulary as well. Um, so we share a lot of loan words in Sanskrit with Indonesia. Um, Kalinga, yes, Kalinga is a, uh, the Kalinga are a very well-known people in, um, in, in India, uh, in present day Odisha. Uh, and um, they were a very warlike people. Um, they are the site of, you know, the, the temple that I showed you, the Konark temple, um, that is Kalinga architecture. So, um, Konark is, um, uh, the, the etymology of that is a, a corner and Arco, Ark is, a uh, Surya, refers to Surya, the sun god. So it's this worship, um, to the sun, uh, which we also have. And it's always fascinated me that, um, the um there's a group uh there's a there's a culture group called the naga in assam uh in india and um this is not part of the kalinga right so it's it's assam um but their material culture is so similar to our kalinga in northern luzon and that's always struck me it's like you know they have the same beads they they so there's so many layers really so many layers of connections and superimpositions on this palimpsest of our culture that's kind of difficult to disentangle but they're there so um i'm not really sure what the uh the etymology of the indian kalinga is but um they're very well known for having been conquered by ashoka uh, in the Mauryan Empire, and you had this, uh, you know, that's how Ashoka found his, uh, was um, converted to Buddhism and became this peaceful uh, emperor uh, because of his conquest of the Kalinga people was so brutal and so uh, bloody uh, that he, you know, was filled with remorse and uh, renounced violence and converted to Buddhism. So the Kalinga are known for, for that bloody aspect of their history, and they became part of the Mauryan Empire. Uh, then subsequently, they were conquered by other empires, and they, be they came under the sphere of several other empires. Um, and, you know, so they remain today. Uh, it's the ancient Kalinga state. They're not called Kalinga anymore. They're, they were called, you know, Orisa and then now Odisha. Uh, but you see on the map, they're on the East Coast and you can easily um, imagine uh, some of these uh, uh, traders um, who were using that Konark temple as their uh, uh, navigational uh, landmark. Uh, to help them as they navigated the Indian Ocean. Uh, and you have the Tamil traders who are further south, who are also uh, known for, you know, for navigation uh, and for their travels uh, through this a vast uh, trade network that found its way to Southeast Asia and then to the Philippines. But then, of course, you know, when the historians study this, somehow we're kind of dropped. Uh, we're kind of, um, it kind of stops at, in Borneo and, and Indonesia and the interest flags, uh, you know, lags when it comes to the Philippines. So I think we need to pick up that end of the, the story and, and connect it to the rest of the larger meta narrative. Yes. Well, picking up from what you mentioned, because it's also one of my frustrations when talking about Asian history, and you know, it, it's it's um, uh, yeah, a bit frustrating when when students ask, "Where's the Philippines?" We're talking about Southeast Asia pre-colonial history, and in maps, in mainstream narratives, we're not there. Um, but very clearly, based on the material culture, we were part of that entire world. So why do you think that is, that we're not visible or present in the these um, more available mainstream maps and uh, narratives? 
I'm guessing that's a very good question. And I'm guessing, but I'm 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 guessing that it's because since we were colonized, right? And we were so westernized and somehow we kind of um, became more associated with Spain and with the Western world, especially with the US, right? We became so Western, so Spanish, so American that um, Southeast, our fellow Southeast Asian cousins um, kind of, I guess, in a way, uh, excised us from their world. And I mean, you see this even today when you talk to other Southeast Asians and conferences and they'll make remarks like, oh, you're so American, you're, you know, you're not, really like Southeast Asian. Da, da, da. So I think that's that's part of it, that well, we were perceived as being so Western that there was not so much interest, even among American scholars, I think, that there was not so much interest in the Philippines because we were too similar to them. We were not, you know, from the side of the Western scholars, we weren't exotic enough um, you know, and we didn't have these big Hindu temples. We didn't have these, you know, Buddhist stupas. Uh, so it, we weren't as interesting uh, because, you know, you need the Western scholars interacting with the local scholars for the discussion to reach the mainstream because we can't just all talk to among ourselves, right? So, so um, and even the concept of Asian art, what is Asian art? What is Southeast Asian art? Those are also defined by Western scholars because as far as they're concerned, what's Western art is East Asia. Uh, you go to um, you know, uh, academic departments or museum departments, if it's a department of Asian art, we're not there. Um, there. The Asian art, as far as they're concerned, it's East Asia. It's China, Japan, Korea. That's Asia. And um, Southeast Asia, we're not there either uh, because uh, when I was working in my book at the Met and I couldn't use the word Southeast Asia, I couldn't use the title Art of Southeast Asia because in um, mainstream scholarship, the art of Southeast Asia is Hindu Buddhist art. Hindu Buddhist art of mainland Southeast Asia, uh, maybe some of the you know island Southeast Asia, um, Indonesia, Borneo, but mainly Hindu Buddhist. So for my book, which was more um, indigenous village traditions, we finally came upon a title that was not considered misleading. So it was the art of island Southeast Asia. Uh, so the, the word island kind of made it a little bit more exotic and a little bit more connected to the Pacific islands. Um, but, you know, so there are all those label. So I think that's part of the reason why uh, we're neither here nor there. Uh, we're, we're not Asia enough, Asian enough, um, and we're not Southeast Asian enough. Um, and, and we're more closely um, um, associated with Latin America and, um, you know, Mexico, Spain, uh, rather than, and it's like our, our pre-colonial culture has been erased, uh, which we need to uh, re-inscribe and reinsert in our consciousness because I think that would be very helpful for us to actually understand who we are. Uh, because we're, we're always complaining about being a hybrid culture that, you know, um, we're we're not we're 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 like this mongrel culture or you have all these um either uh euphemisms or or um various terms that are being used um because we can't quite understand where we actually are thanks that, that that's a lot um of food for thought i think and i was actually led because i i did use your book the arts of island southeast oh you did of course. yeah and and so it really comes from a you know my own personal experience of trying to find traces of where we are um in terms of international visibility and um to pick up on what you said that so much scholarship especially in the west i think um which which for so long really 
took the lead into these kinds of things. It also depends on the collections they've amassed and accumulated. Mm -hmm. Like that book, I think, was based on a particular collection. Yes. And the Philippines was really marginal in terms of objects collected. So they're usually in comparison to what the Indonesians have and then insert a little bit on the Philippines to try to right. socialize the idea. So um, and that's I, interesting. I guess, yeah, so I guess it gives us certain clues also as to how we might assert um, this this uh, earlier cultures more within that that space and narrative, right? Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. I'm I'm uh, happy that you mentioned that book um, because uh, when it first came out, I heard some. Um, you know, murmurings like, you know, how come there's nothing on the Philippines and there's only two objects in the Philippines? I was going, you have to, you have to um, understand the context of that because um, first of all, uh, again, uh, you have uh, on, I guess, in the museum world, you know, the academia is different, right? That's one thing. And then you have the museum world. And the, in academia, um, I guess it's the 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 scholars, the leading scholars, who kind of dictate in a way uh, what is the fashionable field to um, to 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 study. Um, so there are all these waves of you know this is interesting, etc. In the museum world, it's the collections, as you say, it's the collections that dictate what's going to be studied, um, and what dictates the collections. Well, it's the market. So it's what collectors feel will appreciate in value. And so in the non-Western world, um, first it was African art that was being collected because during the, uh, um, what is this? During the, uh, I'm blacking out, uh, the depression, uh, when they could people couldn't afford Western art anymore. We couldn't afford impressionism and all these major Western movements. Then you had this, um, this, this interest in African art because uh, it was affordable. And then, so the prices increased and you know everyone was collecting African art until it became extremely expensive. So then you have collectors who are now starting to collect Indonesian art because it was less expensive than African art. Okay, they never got to the Philippines. I, um, so we were kind of next in line. But so you have Indonesian art. So this collector who donated these objects were primarily collecting Indonesian art. And they just happened to have a couple of Philippine, um, you know, objects that sort of sometimes get mixed in with a, with the Indonesian art. And so, um, so there were two objects. And of course, I included the two objects, right? I mean, I was so happy that there were at least two objects that I could include there. Um, so, so anyway, so that's why there were only two in the book because there were no other. Uh, it was an Indonesian art collection. So you're right. The, um, you know, the collectors uh, in the museum world they do dictate a lot of this, and it impacts also, I think, the academic world because, yeah, because then. Um, there's more interest in your work if it somehow mm -hmm. relates to, you know, what's yeah. what's fashionable and in to, the market. To some extent, the museums are more accessible for a majority of people than scholarly publications. Right. So that's right. That's what I think becomes part of the predominant imagination regarding the cultures in mm -hmm. these areas. But right. But, yeah, I was glad to see at least a few objects, but I was, where else can we, because we know there's so much, of course. Okay, I think we'll be circling back to that point uh, later on, but um, a few more questions on um, the, the Hindu-Buddhist aspects of the images. So one viewer asks, is it with finality that the Butuan, I'm not sure what Butuan image um he or she is referring to uh, if it's the what was known as the golden Tara previously. The Agusan image. The Agusan maybe. image. Yeah. Um, but but the, what, is it finality that it's of Buddhist and not Hindu influence? 
and then a related question from someone else. What is the impact of these influences to the current trends of education for our learners of Butuan? And then a third question that's sort of related also, why did the Butuanons not have a strong religious affiliation or larger unifying influence that could have enabled resistance to Spanish colonization? So I sort of paraphrased that. Um, so, so I guess the first one was on um, the, the Agusan image, Buddhist or Hindu. Definitely, it's Buddhist. Um, I think also, you know how we, we study Western art in, in school uh, and it's required like introduction to this or that. We really need to um, require uh, introduction to Hindu and Buddhist cultures uh, because it can be very uh, confusing if, if you haven't actually studied it. And um, I'm thankful that I had to teach it. So I, I actually had to learn it. Um, but um, yeah, uh, Hindu, Hindu uh, sculpture is very different from Buddhist sculpture. Um, the, the Hindu sculptures usually portray uh, deities, uh, Shiva, Vishnu, Parvati, uh, and the various manifestations. Uh, they're usually very elaborately uh, dressed um and um the the hindu the sorry the buddhist uh, sculptures uh the sculptures of buddha himself uh would be very different um he, he is more ascetic looking it's not as elaborate um but you do have bodhisattvas who are also elaborately um uh dressed uh portraying uh the the holy men before they attain buddhahood and then you have in a figure in, in a sculptural ensemble uh, such as a, a three-dimensional mandala uh, you would have these goddesses and they have very distinct um, placements in the mandala um, of course the three-dimensional mandalas are more rare than your two-dimensional right so the three-dimensional ones, um, the ones that have survived from the 10th to 12th centuries, um, when you recreate them, you have you have the, the Buddhas. And there are uh, several types of three-dimensional mandalas. The um, Vajralasya from Agusan is from a diamond world, Vajradhatu mandala. So there's a specific placing for these images and they all have specific gestures uh, or hand, hand gestures that have helped you identify them. Um, and they have specific headdresses and styles and body ornamentation. And so you, you see how uh, she is very similar to the Vajralasya that survives in Tibet because Tibet is one of these places where a lot of the, of the Buddhist uh, artworks survived. Um, because, you know, um, Indonesia converted to Islam, right? So a lot of the Hindu and Buddhist material, um, you know, it was only in Bali where you have the Hindu Buddhist religion survive. The rest of Indonesia has become Islamic. So you don't have these traditions uh, surviving, so, but you do have, you know, the, the Nanjuk images that are in various museums and you see how closely related they are to the iconography of the Agusan image. So there's no way she can be a Hindu image. She is a Buddhist image from a three-dimensional mandala. And her gesture identifies her as Vajralasya. So very clear, it's Buddhist. Um, and then uh, the follow-up questions have to do with what impact uh, these influence might, uh, what is the impact of these influences on current trends of education for our learners of Butuan? And why did Butuanans not have strong religious affiliations or larger unifying influences that could have enabled resistance to Spanish colonization? I think that's a good question. And I think, um... I think the answer to that would be similar to um, 
the rest of the archipelago except for the Islamic areas. Remember my, the quote I had, I gave uh, when Pigafetta writes that, oh, Raja uh, Humabuan in Cebu, when we when we converted them, uh, we erected this, um, this uh, cross and we would have erected a pillar, a column, uh, if they had been Muslim, because Muslims are more difficult to convert than these heathens. By heathens, he meant Hindu. So the Hindu are easier to convert than the Muslims. And that's the same uh, case uh, in Luzon, where there was a lot of, you know, we believe that uh, our, our religion back then uh, were also um, uh, connected to Hindu Buddhist ideas. Um, and so it was more, it was easier for us to be converted. Somehow the religion is not as, um, what shall I say, um, as uh, firmly structured as Islam, which would make it much harder to convert. Could that also have been the reason as to why Hinduism, despite its presence in many areas of the Philippines, was not did, did not really emerge as a dominant religion versus the, when Christianity was introduced like, systematically uh, throughout the archipelago? I think I think you know I'm not a Hindu expert, but I think um, our Hinduism expert. But um, the, even the term Hinduism is kind of misleading because um, these are, there, there's no like Bible. There's no Hindu Bible. Like, you know, Islam, you have the Quran, Catholics, we have the Bible. There's no such thing in Hinduism. There are all these um, verbal uh, uh, teachings that have been handed down through hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, and so it's very accommodating. Uh, there are several deities that are manifestations of the single God. Um, I think there's this uh, uh, misconception that Hinduism is uh, polytheistic, but it's not. There is a supreme God with multiple manifestations. And so with these multiple manifestations, it's very accommodating. It can accommodate other religions and incorporate it in its own pantheon. In fact, uh, in, even though Buddhism emerged from Hinduism, um, Hinduism reabsorbed Buddhism and took the Buddha back as, I know this is the historical Buddha, he's a real person who existed and, and Hinduism takes him back and makes him a reincarnation of uh, Vishnu and Krishna. So it's very accommodating that way. Um, so I think maybe um, that's, uh, you know, that's part of uh, the reason why um, we were so accommodating that it was very easy for us to be uh, swayed into accepting this other religion and actually making it part of our religion. Um, and so, but, but you do have these concepts that survive within Catholicism. You have all these pre-Catholic um, ideas and concepts and practices that have survived and had just intersected and converged with, uh, with uh, the new religion. For example, the primordial mother, you know, the, the important primordial mother, which is now, you know, we have accepted and transmuted her into the Virgin Mary. Um, but but before Catholicism, there was always this powerful female. Okay. I'll just read a comment from um, Greg Ontiveros, who's a historian uh, from I, one. Yes. So yes. he says, there is another gold item found near the Agusan River upstream of Butuan, which was in the possession of the late jewelry historian Ramon Villegas. It was called Mahapratisara Amulet. A Filipino researcher, Roderick Orlina, was able to secure the yes. Sanskrit translation of the amulet from Dr. Mm -hmm. Arlo Griffith, and his work was published in an international Buddhist journal. I hope more attention on this item be given uh, prominence. Where is it, by the way? Does he know, Greg? Do you know where? 
Um, I read Rod Arlina's work. In fact, I met him. And um, yeah, it was extremely interesting, but it wasn't clear to me where these objects are and how we can access them and see them. Perhaps uh, uh, Mr. Antiveris, you can type it in the chat box um, in answer to that question. Um, more questions on the tools. Um, Father Tony De Castro says, the material products that you showed, the four pieces, were found in the Butuan area in Caraga. Um, would you have any information on the tools used in the production process? And are there artifacts of such tools? And then there's a related question from another viewer. Is our knowledge of forging steel blades originally from Indonesia or Malaysia? When did we start forging metal? Hmm. Becoming very technical questions. <laughs> okay, um, the four pieces. The four pieces, um, they were all recovered in bar Barrio Magroyong. Um, near present-day Butuan, uh, and they were uh, part of that that big Surigao uh, hoard uh, that were found. Um, were there tools that were discovered? No, um, not not in the same site. Uh, whatever tools were recovered were recovered with the Butuan bolts, and those would be in the possession of the national museum and i think we have some speakers from the national museum that are joining and they would have more knowledge about that um then um when did we start forging were they was it um introduced from malaysia and indonesia i think we should um kind of try to stay away from this maybe this this idea that oh everything everything we know must have come from somewhere else uh, which is not necessarily the case um, I think there's uh, an argument for independent invention, and there's also this, uh, you know, the circulation of peoples and and uh, technologies, and so it would be, I think, very difficult to actually pinpoint if there's an exact date that oh, at this point in history, uh, someone from Indonesia, you know, Sri, whatever his name is, came and taught the Butuanons how to forge and, you know, uh, you know we, we can't actually, we don't have the information for that. But I think we can safely say that uh, whatever metalsmithing and goldsmithing traditions that we might have, whether in Butuan or in the rest of the archipelago, that these are technologies that are not unique to us, that we're not these are technologies that were not independently um, um, developed, but these are technologies that uh, were developed and refined and um, affected and impacted by external forces that we came in touch with because we were not an isolated People, we were in constant contact with each other and with our uh, neighbors in Southeast Asia. So there was always this conversation of uh, an exchange of concepts and technology, and it was not one way. We were not necessarily always on the receiving end. We were also on the giving end. So it was always an exchange um, of all these techniques and knowledge. Okay, so very important point to remember. Um, so we go back to uh, the symbolisms. What are the common symbols depicted in gold, Hindu-influenced artifacts in the Philippines? And are rings, rings a common accessory um, in uh, early Philippines? Yeah. Yes, we love rings. Um, yeah. Um, and in fact, you know, we're looking, we're looking at the Tagalog, uh, if we look at the Tagalog uh, material, 
um, none of the uh, larger anthropomorphic ritual images survived in the north, right? But we have a lot of rings because I'm guessing maybe the rings are um, less conspicuous as, uh, as uh, you know, ritual images so that it was easier to hang on to them um, and not have them melted or, um, you know, uh, destroyed as idolatrous. Um, so, uh, what were the sim the most common symbols? Uh, the most telling symbols. Well, of course, you have the three rings, right? Those everywhere. We see them everywhere uh, in the Philippines and in Indonesia as, and the rest of Southeast Asia. And those rings, uh, as I mentioned earlier, some of them could have been imported. Some of them we could have made and exported them. You know, it's it would require uh, a lot of uh, technological, scientific. Um, um, studies to study the, the different um, technologies and different gold content, etc. Uh, but the most common symbols that um, that we can see that connect to Buddhism would be Garuda. Garuda is the mount of the Hindu god Vishnu, and Garuda uh, um, occurs in both Hindu and Buddhist art. Um, the Kinari is another. Uh, she is half human, half female, and there are several stories attached to her. Uh, Kinari is the female form and uh, Kinara is the male form. And there are several different narratives. And again, we see the Kinari both in Hindu art and in Buddhist art. And it's uh, she's very prominent in the Burubudur, which is a Buddhist uh, uh, temple uh, in, in Indonesia. You also have uh, what are the others? We have the Kirti Muka, which is the face of glory, which is Hindu. We find that in some of the rings. We have the uh, horn-shaped uh, rings that um, re reference uh, uh, Nandi, who is the bull, who is the mount of Shiva. Um, so we have that and um, the conch shell, which is one of the attributes of Vishnu. So you have images of the conch shell in the modesty plaques and in various other uh, um, images. Um, so um, those are what I can think of uh, at this point. Of course, we have the Kali, what I, I call her the Kali. You have that female and you have the chariot, which is closely associated with Surya, the sun god. Great. Um, is there a theory for the decline of Butuan as a major trade center? One of our viewers asked. That's a question. That's that, that's my question as well. Um, but um, I, do we have Victor Paz in here um, or any of the National Museum archaeologists in the audience? Um, so yeah, but I'm, maybe just just to interject. Also, by the way, if if you can. Continue with the rest of the panels during the week. I think some of the questions can also be answered by the input right, that, right. that we'll get there. Right, yeah, right. but go ahead. I'm assuming that because this is not my um, argument that that it declined in the 13th century. This is something that I've read in the archaeological record. Um, uh, there was a summary given by Margarita Sembrano of the National Museum excavations from the 1970s and we did on Kilio also summarized it and the finding was that um, based on the National Museum's excavations their interpretation is that this polity because of the nature of what they found and the stratigraphy of the uh, excavations uh, that this is a, a polity that that flourished from the 10th to the 13th century. And I'm guessing that they're saying it mysteriously declined in the 13th century because probably there was no more archeological material after the 13th century. Um, so that's the only reason I can think of. And there are a number of uh, reasons why uh, archeologists will say, oh, this, this kingdom declined. Um, for example, Funan uh, and the site of Okeo, which is the earliest known Southeast Asian kingdom from the first to the seventh centuries, that also mysteriously declined because there was no more record. After the seventh century, uh, 
all the artifacts disappear. They couldn't find anything anymore. And one theory is that the the sea level, the water level changed. And so um, this is, I'm talking about Okeo, the water level changed so that um, the agricultural fields uh, could no longer be used because they were uh, flooded. And this is why it is believed that the population moved and then the center of uh, the Funan kingdom, uh, well, the Funan kingdom declined and the center moved to Champa. Um, so a similar dynamic could be at play here where um, either because they, they could no longer find any archaeological evidence of um, habitation in that site. Um, well, if you if there's no evidence of habitation in that particular site, it doesn't necessarily mean that the people disappeared, right? They probably moved to a different site. And what they found in the excavations is uh, ancient Butuan is not where Butuan city is now. Ancient Butuan was further out near the water, which makes sense uh, because it's a coastal community uh, connected to the maritime trade. And so um, uh, it could have been that Butuan kept moving inland. Um, and so because the, because for me, the discrepancy is if, if it declined and disappeared in the 13th century, then who are these people that Magellan saw? This was the 16th century. And he's saying his kingdom is called Butuan. So how can you say that it declined and disappeared at the time? Um, so I think that would be a very good question for, oh, maybe always Balunia. Uh, she's speaking, right? Yeah, she, she could probably answer that question because she's excavating right now. Um, so, you know, and I'm sure in archaeology, as in art history, we're always updating you know, our findings. So I'm not sure that maybe um, the, the Butuan uh, excavations now have updates and have new interpretations. Okay, so thank you for patiently answering all these questions. I think our audience are really learning so much. Um, but uh, like I mentioned earlier, I'd like to circle back to some of the, I think, really important points that uh, you brought up. Um, so one viewer asks, um, you've mentioned the idea of uh, the label exotic or not being Asian enough or Oriental enough um, in defining what, how the Philippines relate to Southeast Asia and the region, etc. Given this, how do we free ourselves from such dictates of mainstream scholarship? And then a related um, question, how can these examples of material culture uh, help the Philippines claim and strengthen its place within the pre-colonial history and culture of the region? And lastly, uh, you mentioned many misinterpretations um, when reading or looking at objects that have been uncovered. Um, so how can these misinterpretations and misidentifications be effectively updated with the new information so that it enters the mainstream narrative? Interesting question, and I guess a, a little bit difficult um, yeah, to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how to, first of all, um, okay, what's the first question? Uh, so the idea of the Philippines place in Southeast Asia, our place in Southeast culture, Asia. and how, how do we sort of, you mentioned reinserting the fragments that reinsert us into the narrative. So how do we claim our place in this pre-colonial, pre-Islamic um, cultural interaction and world? First of all, we have to get into the map. We we have to get into that map. I, I I didn't show you I didn't show you another map of the Buddhist influence uh, in the 11th century uh, that included the Philippines, but it didn't have us colored you know the color coding of the you know and we weren't included in that. Um, and I think how to get that we need to we need to um, 
have these conversations with our overseas colleagues as well, who have greater control over the, you know, the mainstream um, scholarship. Uh, but we have to begin at home also and um, kind of start uh, reinserting this in our in our own histories, what we teach in school. Um, as I said earlier, there should be, uh, you know, I don't know how difficult it is to, to insert uh, new topics in the curricula, but definitely from from you know elementary school uh, to high school to college, we should we should already introduce these these um, new findings. Um, and I know it's very difficult to uh, to kind of rectify a misconception that's been there for several generations. That's very challenging, and I think it'll take several more generations as well. Um, for us to really, uh, you know, correct this and and um, have it accepted. I mean, even Bashra Lassia, uh, you know, people still continue to call her Tara. Um, Tara is a specific goddess, uh, hi, uh, Hindu goddess. So it's it's the, it, it's very uh, inaccurate, but you know, it's it's very challenging to to have new findings. Uh, accepted into the mainstream. Um, so I think that's something that our younger scholars, I mean, I, we continue to do it, but I think it's something that we need to share with the younger scholars, um, not just with the grade school, et cetera, to high school, but also with our graduate students and make sure that they push these changes forward and more, um, more conversations in international conferences and and uh, you know when we speak to our colleagues overseas, we need to pound this idea and and keep repeating it that you know we want to be a uh, part of this conversation and we we cannot be invisible. Our our Hindu Buddhist uh, heritage can no longer be invisible. We cannot keep um, denying this heritage that we have. And, um, you know, we are often called uh, Filipino scholars of an older uh, generation, as well as Western scholars have been guilty of calling the Philippines a cultural backwaters. Uh, we have been called a cultural backwaters until the coming of the Spaniards. This is so inaccurate. And you still find this in the Oxford Dictionary. I tried to have it changed. I don't know if it's been changed. Um, you see it everywhere and you you still have uh, various professors of a high stature in very influential institutions who refuse to change their views uh, and continue to refer to our culture as a cultural backwater. If you are involved with uh, Sri Vijaya and Chola and you're part of this network and you're mentioned in the Song Shi, and you have these gold ornaments, how can you be a cultural backwater? So that has to be changed. Um, so you have to make these changes in several levels. You have to make it the change internationally uh, with, uh, with our own graduate students, our own faculty, and you have to uh, uh, institute it in the uh, uh, school system as well. And it's a very difficult task um so i don't i don't see foresee that it's something that's going to happen tomorrow um but we have to just keep you know working at it and 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 you know. I'll, I'll tell you a story um when i was at the metropolitan museum and um some of the uh contemporary art uh artists friends of mine asked me this was maybe 20 years ago asked me when the Philippines would ever be exhibited, uh, the contemporary Philippine art would ever be exhibited um, at the Met or at a major US museum. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's never gonna happen. It's never gonna happen because we're just now making inroads. And you know how we got into the museum? Through tribal art, because that was something fashionable. And so so we exhibit Igorot material, but how will they ever um, 
take seriously our contemporary art, which is being dismissed as derivative, just, you know, something, you know, spun off and copied from, uh, from Western sources. But guess what? We're now in major museums in my lifetime. I'm going, I was wrong. You know, contemporary art is highly respected. It's, we've shown it overseas. We've shown Fernanda Sobel in Venice. We've shown what, Bogi Ruiz in Venice Biennale. Uh, you have Patrick Flores uh, being very um, uh, active uh, globally. And it's being taken seriously. And you have colonial Philippine art that is now very fashionable. Um, you have scholars, you have Western scholars who are now looking at uh, Spanish colonial art of the Philippines and actually looking at seriously, not just as a derivative art, but as a legitimate art form. Um, so, so, you know, we can be pessimistic or optimistic, um, but it will happen. I mean, it will happen if we keep uh, working on it and, um, you know, pushing forward with it, it will happen. So it's really to be championed. Well, we're hopeful because a lot of people in our audience are educators and hopefully they take what they learned here and translate it into um, the, the lessons and the, the stuff that they're teaching. Uh, the right. students, so it trickles down. But as you mentioned, it's uh, it's a challenge. I, I just you know have in my head that whole difficulty of the classical sculpt white sculptures that are actually painted, but in the imagination of many people, they're still white sculptures. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly, exactly. And, and but so they're... much more well known. What more this? And I remember. Like being in the Louvre, Louvre, that enormous collection, and trying to find is there anything on the Philippines here? And I was just able to find one piece. I think it was a bulol, and it was just of course. lumped in, lumped in with African Oceania artifacts, yes. tribal, yes. small yes, yes. piece, and that's it. So um, hopefully, we become more more visible in the future and and come into our own in terms of our place within this regional and cultural history. Right. And, and, and I might add, not as a stereotype. Yes. Uh, we want to come into the conversation by um, in totality, mm -hmm. um, showing the totality of our culture and our history and not being lumped into a stereotypical niche of uh, yeah. oh they're tribal oh oh they're uh, colonial okay. and oh now they're you know I mean, it has to be that the totality of the culture um, because you can't really understand one period without mm -hmm. understanding um, the other periods as well yep and I, I do agree that maps are very important in a sense they're like an infographic and the exactly. presence or absence uh, says a lot, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think we've learned so much. There's so much food for thought. And hopefully this stimulates our viewers to, to think about our own history, not just from 500 years ago, but far beyond that. We've had a long and rich um, and literally rich also in terms of material cultural production. Um, there's tangible evidence of this and our ties with our neighboring uh, cultures and societies. So um, let me end with that. Are there any last words you'd like to share before we close? Uh, yes, I'd like panel? to make... I'd like to make one final appeal. I do this every time I um, show the gold material, which is... I'd like to appeal to my colleagues who are specialists in Hinduism, Buddhist, Hindu art, Buddhist art, um, colleagues in the Philippines and in Southeast Asia and in South Asia um, to, to um, cast your, your sights on the Philippine connections uh, and try to connect your material with the Philippine material so that together we can connect these dots and arrive at a more accurate um, 
uh, configuration of our uh, cultural history. So oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Baker. At this point, please allow me to read the Certificate of Appreciation for our speaker. I think our organizers will be flashing it onto the screen. Mr. Alec, Mr. Janelle, can we please flash the certificate onto the screen? And, and that they, they fine. can also yeah. see the comments on the chat box. I think uh, they really were very happy with the presentation. Um, in, in any case, I can, I'll just read the citation um, for her invaluable service and contribution as session speaker in the early Philippine and Southeast Asian boat building and gold crafting technology session during the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference held online on December 6, 2021, given this sixth day of December 2021 at Father Saturnino Urios University, Butuan City, Philippines, and signed by Reverend Father John Christian Young, President of Father Saturnino Urios University, and Dr. Rene Escalante, Chairman of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. Um, so that's it for this particular panel. I'd now like to turn the floor over to uh, Noel, who will invite us to the succeeding sessions. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Thank you. My pleasure. I'm very honored. Thank you. Okay. Noel? Yes. Uh what a rich and uh, enlightening and meaningful start to our conference. Thank you very much for being with us in Panel A. Please join us this afternoon at 2 p.m. for another presentation by Victor P. Estrella of Philippine Normal University and Ateneo de Manila University. He shall be speaking on Philippine pre-colonial gold, Shan Operatoire, and the social construction of technology. So the questions earlier could be answered by um, Mr. Estrella later and by our other speakers tomorrow. Again, this conference runs from December 6 to 10. Join us for more deep and meaningful discussions on the early Philippine and Southeast Asian boat and gold crafting technology. On behalf of the Satur Father Saturnino Orios University and the National Quincentennial Committee, we wish to thank those behind the scenes, the conference uh, secretariat, and of course, to our speaker, Dr. Florina H. Capistrano Baker, who gave so much of her time, her knowledge, and the sharing of her experience with us. And of course, to our moderator, Isabel uh, Consuelo Nazareno, who has helped make the discussion so lively. And to all of you who joined with the discussion, with the comments, with the questions. Let us continue and thank you for joining us this morning. See you this afternoon at 2 p.m. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for being here and have a good day. We hope that you join the afternoon session.